food and fellowship at 5. At 6, we'll begin the time of praise and worship. Brother Josh Revis will be here speaking. We encourage every young person to be present and young adults to come as well for the message God has for you. Now, I praise God for our young people. Amen? Amen. Thank the Lord for every one of them. And you know, most of you who are in here on Wednesday night don't know what's going on in the rest of the church. There are about 25 kids and RAs and GAs back there running around, and there's I don't know how many of you. So let me just show you what it looks like. I'm going to ask all of our teenagers and then all of our boys and girls who are in RAs or GAs as well as our youth, I'm going to ask you to stand right now. Would you do that, please? Come on, stand up. Amen. Look at that. All the way back there in the back. Look back there. In the, I see y'all way back there in the corner. Amen. All right. Thank y'all. Isn't it a blessing and a joy to have them in with us tonight, worshiping and praising the Lord together. And Saturday is going to be a very special time, and we encourage all of our teenagers all of our young adults to be present for the youth rally on Saturday beginning at 5. Also, this week as we launch out, of course, uh, many places across our Southern Baptist Convention, but right here at Hoboken, we're going to do what we call starting the big invite. We're zeroing in on Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday ought to be the greatest day that we have. A lot of people, you know, they'll come to church on Easter when they won't come any other time. And I told Brother Tim tonight, I think it's because of life and death, the resurrection, all that hope that is found in Christ. So between now and Easter, the first thing I'm asking you to do is commit you and your family to be here that Sunday morning for Sunday school and church. And then in addition to that, make you a list of people that you would like to see coming with you and exercise the big invite and invite them to come and to be here that Sunday morning. We will have the sunrise service. It'll probably be somewhere around 7. And then we'll have breakfast. And then uh, after that, later on, we will have Sunday school. And then at 11 o'clock, the one morning worship service that we will have. Of course, we'll have worship time at the sunrise service. But we want you to invite every person you can for Sunday school and church on Easter Sunday morning. It's going to be a great time together in the house of the Lord, and we want you to come and be a part of it all. Also on the back of the Wednesday reminder, like I said, usually we have the Bible study on the back, but I took the privilege of listing all the upcoming events that I know that are ahead of us. And I want you to take note of those, keep them in mind, be praying about them, set aside the time on your calendar to be a part of them all, and you will praise the Lord for everything, everything that you enjoy in the presence of God. The Lord is gracious, he is great, and greatly to be praised. And I want to tell you one thing, as I tell folks, our one duty is to love the Lord with all our heart and to enjoy him forever. I'm glad I'm saved, amen? amen. And I enjoy the Lord, and I enjoy his presence. We want to glorify his name as Brother John comes to lead us in our love offering hymn. Let's all stand together as we sing. Somebody told me, said you, you heard what's going on.
Lord makes lots of respect. But we're going to sing it. Ready? Bless the Lord. And and all. Look here. We all pray for me, okay? Because as soon as church is over, people are going to take me and beat me. <laughs> See if y'all can, hey, turn to I'll Fly Away. Okay? Y'all all know that. Come on, let's sing. Let's sing it to the praise of the Lord. Brother John, come on and lead us. I don't know that Some I can. Some glad morning. Oh, that song. Yeah, come on. Here we go. Some glad morning. All right. Some glad morning when this life is over.
I really hate to foul up. It's really embarrassing to me to do it, but I had, I, you know, I, what can I do? They won't let me go home until it's over, you know, so. That's right, you gotta stay for the duration. Yes, sir. Amen. I just want to take a minute before our last two special music, and we certainly want to welcome Brother Tim King back to the pulpit tonight, and we thank the Lord for the messages that God's placed upon his heart, and I know that he's given him a message for each and every one of us who are here tonight. Now let me say this before he comes. In every way, whatever the need is in your life, listen. The Bible said that God is able to meet every need according to his riches in glory. If you don't know Jesus, you can know him tonight. If you need a church home, the doors are open to receive you. If you need to come to this altar and pray, God has an ever listening ear. And all you have to do is to call upon his mighty name that the power of God will be manifest in your life. I also want to say I appreciate all these who have been involved in the music this week, Brother John, the choir, all those who have worked hard to bring music that will honor and glorify the Lord, and I thank the Lord for them. I thank the Lord for those of you who have been faithful to each and every service and that God has spoken in your heart and in your life. And tonight, I know that you'll be praying after our special music that Brother Tim comes and brings a message God has placed upon his heart. Mary and Elaine and I are going to sing, and I'm going to tell you, we, we found a day, we know 10 other songs we can sing. But I like when he comes down the best. And I like it for what it says. Amen. I like it because the two events that have been worldly recognized events are going to pale in comparison when he steps out and comes to get us. Amen. Can't beat that. When he comes down. And somebody always asks for it, and it's not the only song we need. <laughs> anyway. When Jesus was here, he gave us the words of eternal life. And he gave us his peace, and he said, I'll not leave you alone. And though I wasn't there, the multitude watched him
sing the same song over and over. <laughs> that was great. My husband's giving me permission to talk tonight, so I'm going to. <laughs> oh, I like to razz him about that. Um, I'm going to introduce this song to you. Uh, one reason is because it means so much to me. And I'm not going to cry because I can't sing and cry at the same time. But um, my sister wrote this one. And I'm sorry. My sister meant a lot to me. She was such a blessing. Anytime I ever needed to talk to somebody about the Lord, I could call Amy up and ask her questions and just talk to her and vent. She would always listen. She was so... Anyway, um, she wrote this song that's called Mindful of Me, and uh, she uh, sang it to me one day over the phone. She's like, listen to this song I wrote, Amanda. What do you think? <laughs> and I couldn't help but cry just listening to it over the phone. They didn't even have it really together then, but it was just beautiful, the words. She got it from the Psalms, and... Um, I was reading the Psalms this morning, and so many times in the Psalms, David mentions how God is mindful of him and how he's just astonished that God is mindful of him. And uh, I think about it, too, sometimes, you know, how 
Well, actually a lot, because I wonder why in the world he would ever have anything to do with me. But uh, that's what this song is about, just, you know, how God is mindful of everything about us. And if, if I get to thinking about it too much, it's mind-boggling. He knows everything about me, and he loves me anyway, <laughs> which is amazing. So anyway, this song, I hope it blesses your heart as much as it did and does mine still, and I hope I can make it through it. All right, and I hope my guitar's in tune, too. Praise the Lord. 
Has the singing been a blessing to you tonight? I'm so blessed. My cup's already running over. And uh, I just want to, I don't want to leave anybody out because it's been a blessed week. I can't believe it's already the last night of revival. It's flown by. I was, uh, a lot of people will come up to you and ask, you know, at, at school they ask, I'm going to sit my water right here so it's handy. They'll ask us, you know, how's the revival going? And I've been telling them, well, you know, I don't know how it's going for everybody else, <laughs> but it's been really good for me. Um, thank God, Brother Ben, the liberty that's in this place, you know. Uh, it's not dry. It's, uh, you can feel the Holy Spirit, amen. And that helps so much when you're preaching the Word of God. But I tell you, the music's been fantastic. Brother, Brother John, don't apologize about anything. You know, um, I'm sitting out there. And it sounds great, and everybody knows you love that choir. And I tell you what, you just keep on keeping on because it's fantastic. <laughs> and I want to say to Brother Ben again, thanks so much and uh, Hoboken Baptist Church for uh, allowing me to come. And uh, I'm overwhelmed that you would uh, give me the opportunity to do this. Uh, it's, it's very, very, very hard on me. The nervous part for me has always been preaching when Brother Ben's sitting out there, amen. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, y'all tonight, the Lord has uh, laid something on my heart, uh, and, and this was uh, many days back, and uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10, if you will. And tonight, I'm going to give you the recipe for true revival, and this is not any secret knowledge. This is common knowledge from the Word of God. You know it, and I assure you tonight, if you take the formula that we're about to read, you will experience revival. There is no missing it. There is no doubt about it. On the authority of the Word of the Lord, all of us tonight can, and I said can, I did not say will, but we all can, if we have a desire, we can experience revival and the revival, God can just move in, the, in our midst, and he can do things that we can never even think or imagine. Are you in John chapter 10? If you would stand to show honor and reverence of the word of God, and I want you to find verse 17, John chapter 10, verse 17. Let's read God's word. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. That means of my own free will. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Let us pray. Father, tonight as we preach the Word of God, I pray you would open hearts and minds, Father, to receive the good Word of God with meekness, Father, the engrafted Word of God that's able to save the soul. Father, tonight uh, we know, Father, that you're on the throne, and we know that Jesus Christ tonight has been exalted. Now, Father, it's our prayer, God, that all would experience revival tonight. And Father, especially if someone today is lost, that tonight would be their night that they would nail it down and know for sure where they're going when they die. Save that which is lost. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. <clears throat> the title of the message tonight is a laid down life. And folks, that's what it's going to take for you to experience all that God has for you. Do you realize tonight you're going to have all of God that you want? Amen. Now, folks, that's something you need to address tonight in your heart of hearts. Christian, we'll have all of the Lord that we want. And I hope and pray tonight that we'll want him more than any other thing. Amen. 
Jesus uh, willingly laid down his life. If you look back at the text, it's so simple, but yet it's very, very profound. Look at it again. He says, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. He's talking about Calvary's cross right there, folks. Jesus is saying that he laid down his life willingly. And you know who he did it for? He did it for me and you. The Bible says he died for the sinner, amen. And that's all of us. The Bible says that he did it willingly. You know, you hear all kind of things and, and I understand exactly where it's coming from. You know, I could go back in the Bible tonight and I could prove to you that the Jews were responsible for the unbelieving Jews, the Pharisees and, and the, the Sanhedrin. And, and they were responsible, if you will, uh, for Jesus being crucified. Why? They went to the Roman authorities. Hey, and they said, crucify him his own blood kin now listen to this his own blood kin and not not just that but the levitical priesthood they cried out away with this man crucify him crucify him his blood be upon us and upon our children but then I can also prove to you from the scripture that the Romans also were involved in his crucifixion they're guilty because Pontius Pilate made the final uh, decree that he would be crucified. And those Roman soldiers took part in all of that. As they tortured him and as they beat him beyond recognition. And then they nailed him to a cross. But do you know who actually nailed him to the cross? He did. Jesus willingly died on Calvary's cross. Make no mistake about it. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, that God the Father, it pleased God the Father that he would die for us, amen. And it said that it satisfied God the Father in Isaiah 53. Beloved, listen, he died a substitutionary death in our place. What I'm trying to tell you is he willingly laid down his life. Don't you understand? If it was not his will, no one could have touched him. No one could have harmed him. He said he could have called down legions of angels at any given time and they would have rescued him from that death and guess what? You and I would have been destined to a place called hell but he willingly laid down his life. Can you picture that? Let me tell you how that thing worked so we can understand it. And by the way, if you want revival, you'll have it tonight but you got to make a decision whether or not you want it. And I'm going to tell you how to have it. You're going to have to lay down your life. It's called a laid down life. The Bible says he willingly died on Calvary's cross. We saw it in Gethsemane's garden as Jesus was praying in agony in the garden of Gethsemane. And what did he pray? He said, Father, if it be thy will that this cup may pass from me. But he said, he said if this cup may just but pass from me. He said, but nevertheless, what comes next, y'all? Not mine, but thy will be done. He prayed this three times. He said, Father, may this cup, if it be possible, that this cup might pass from me. He says, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Are you listening, Christian? Are you listening? That's the key to a laid down life. It's placing God's will ahead of your own. Can I get a witness? And you see, he prayed that in earnest and in agony. And beloved, I don't believe he was praying. I don't believe what concerned him was, was, was the pain. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, and the pain was uh, the most, it can, you can't imagine if you get down and study crucifixion, and if you study what he went through before they even nailed him to the cross, you'll realize that he was beaten beyond recognition. If you've watched uh, 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 dramatizations about the cross, they do not express what he looked like. The Bible says he was beaten beyond recognition. It says in Isaiah 52 that he was beaten. It says to the point that his visage was so marred, more than any man's appearance had ever been marred by beating. He was beaten beyond recognition. And then they nailed him to the cross. And he allowed it. He allowed, he, he allowed wicked, wicked men to just take their hands and just slap his face uh, and mock him and, and, and say, prophesy if thou be the son of God. They spit upon him and they took their hands and they plucked his beard out of his face. Uh, and he did nothing. He did not even open his mouth. 
Why did he do this? I'll tell you, he come to lay his life down. His first coming was all about a laid down life, amen. And if you're going to experience revival, you're going to have to have a laid down life. And I'm telling you, if you're, if you're lost tonight, and let, me, let me define that for you. If you don't know where you're going when you die, and if, you are, and if you're living your life right now just as if what I'm talking about never took place, and if you don't really give any thought whatsoever to the cross of Calvary, I'm telling you right now, you need to lay down your life, and you need to lay down your will and you need to accept Jesus Christ. After they beat him, they nailed him to that cross beam. And in my heart of hearts, I don't believe for a moment he ever resisted. Now, if that had been me, and if they tried to grab my hand, and if they tried to lay that hand down on the cross beam of the cross and they began to nail those spikes in my hand, I would try to resist. I don't believe he did. You know what? The Bible says he was willing to lay down his life for us. I believe in my heart of hearts, Brother Ben, when it came time for him to lie down, and those, I think he took that hand, Brother Ben, of his own power, and he laid that hand right down, and there it lay, and they drove the spikes in. And I believe by his own free will, he took that other hand, and he laid it right down for the spike. And then they drove them through his feet, and then they erected that cross. Do you know how they erected the cross? You ever put a post in a post hole? There was a hole in the ground and they took that cross and they raised him up upon that cross and they jolted that, that cross down into that hole in the ground. And when that took place, the full weight of my Savior's body came down upon those nails in his hands and in his feet. And the Bible says he did it willingly. He had just prayed uh, just, just minutes, just hours before. If, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. I don't believe that the cup was just the cross and the agony. I believe that was a part of it. But I'm going to tell you something. He was suffering something even more that you may not be aware of tonight. And if you're lost tonight, you need to listen to me and don't miss what I'm telling you. He was suffering something else that nobody could see. He was bearing a burden that nobody could see while all that was going on. The Bible says, is, uh, that he was bearing our sins upon his shoulders uh, while he was nailed to that cross. Uh, your Bible says in 2 Corinthians, for he, that means God the Father, for he hath made him God the Son. Let me start over. For he hath made him to be sin for us uh, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Sometimes uh, you got to preach loud. And sometimes you got to get the message out. And I'm telling you today, all the while that he was hanging on that cross, he was bearing our sins. Don't you understand? He was carrying my sins. God the Father, for the space of three hours, had to turn his back on his son. Let me tell you something about God. Listen, if you're playing games at the foot of the cross, you better listen to me today. There could be some young people right now that you're putting off getting saved and you're doing things and you're saying, I'll do it later. There could be an adult here today that it's time that you nail it down, but you haven't done it yet. You're dilly-dallying around. I tell you right now, don't you let a can of beer, don't you let a marijuana cigarette, don't you let any party keep you from heaven. There's going to be a many a good old boy that will die and go to hell because of a can of beer. Now, I'm not talking about that they can't be saved. I'm trying to tell you this. They don't want to get saved because they know, hey, they know the preacher's telling the truth. But listen, if, if they get saved, then they're going to have to quit. You know, I, I, I'm just not quite ready yet. You understand? How would you like to die? Now, listen to me. How would you like to die and have to stand before the God of all glory? And we will. It is appointed that a man wants to die, but after that, the judgment. How would you like to stand before God at the great white throne judgment? And, and it may just be a simple fact that you missed heaven and he's about to send you to hell because you didn't want to give up a can of Budweiser. Wake up. It's time to wake up. You want revival tonight? It's going to take a laid down life. He bore our sins. 
God the Father. The Bible says for the space of three hours when he was crucified, in daylight hours, all of a sudden darkness was on the whole face of the earth. That means all around the earth at one time. It was dark for the space of three hours. You know what that was? That was God the Father turning his back on his son on Calvary, the son that he loved. Why would he do that? Let me tell you something about that. We're living in a generation, a society today, and a culture today that is so messed up concerning right and wrong. And let me tell you something, folks. Let me tell you the character of God Almighty. Don't never forget this. God is love. I'll be the first to tell you because he loves even old sinners. And God is love. That's one of his main attributes. God is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says, greater, lo greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. God is love, John the Beloved said on the Isle of Patmos. But I'm going to tell you what, God's got another attribute that comes before his attribute of love. Don't ever miss this. Because if you miss this, you may miss heaven. Our God is holy. One more time. Our God is holy. And you cannot have a hope of ever standing in his presence unless you are. Now, let me make that plain to you. Jesus said it this way. He said, he told the disciples, he told those in his midst when he walked this earth, he said this, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter the kingdom of God. Do you know what that means? You can't get into heaven with one sin. Not one. No sin can dwell in his presence. Not one. My, my loving mama's here tonight, and I'm so thankful. My mama loves me, and I love her. You understand me? And if mama wanted to whip me right now, I'd take it. <laughs> my mama loves me, and I, know my, and I know my mama's let some of my trifleness, you know, kind of go. I'm sure she didn't whip me for all of it because mamas are like that. Amen? Amen? And I've got a wife that loves me. And I've got a family that loves me. You know, they overlook a lot of my faults and all my, uh, my stuff like that. But let me tell you something. God, God can't do that. You, there's something you must understand. God cannot dwell with sin. You know what that does for you and I? It counts us out. But I've got good news. I've got some wonderful news. You see, when we couldn't come to God because of our sin, are you listening? God came down to this earth, the God-man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, living a sinless life, being the sin-bearer on Calvary's cross, shedding his blood in remission of, for remission of our sins and for all that trust in him, for everyone that gives their heart and life to him, your sins are gone. The moment you accept Jesus Christ, the Bible calls that a new birth. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he was a lost religious man, Nicodemus was. Nicodemus was as nice as any lost person today that's religious. There could be a lost religious person in here tonight. And you're religious to the core. And you're nicer than I am. But you've never been saved. You can't make it to heaven. If Nicodemus had to be born again, and if the apostle Paul had to be born again, you've got to be born again. All God's children got to be born again. Y'all with me say amen. amen. Beloved, he died a substitutionary death so that you and I could live. When you trust him as your personal savior, here's what happens. You take on his righteousness. And when you get saved, your spirit is just as sinless as the Son of God. We call it justification. 
We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ and nothing else. And by the way, you want to get to heaven, trust in Jesus Christ. You want to miss heaven, trust in anything else. It's just that simple. We make it too hard. Folks, we make it too hard. It's so simple, a child can understand. One more time. You want to make it to heaven, trust Jesus Christ. If you're going to miss heaven, trust anything else. And that's it. Don't trust in your goodness because it won't get you there. We're used to things being swept under the rug, aren't we? But let me share something with you. If Jesus had to go through all that, and he did, so that you and I could make it into heaven, what's going to become of those that lived their life and never accepted him? You understand what I'm saying, don't you? If you could just squeak on in there like you're planning on doing without getting saved, then you realize what you're saying? You're saying that his death was in vain and it was for nothing. You see, if righteousness came by the workings of the law, in other words, if I could pull my bootstraps up and just be good enough and be nice and get it into heaven by my own, you with me? If I could just start being nicer, by the way, that's what we always tell everybody, be nice, be nice, be nice. You know why it's hard? You know why you, ha you, know why you have to say it so much? <laughs> well, I think we know, don't we? Just be nice. I have this crazy habit at school. Y'all know I'm a school teacher down here at Brantley County, and I teach seventh graders. And I've got this crazy habit. When, when one of them gets in trouble, I, I do this. I always do this, Brother Ben. I maybe, you know, have to call them out in the hall for a conference with the other teachers or maybe, you know, in the classroom. They've done something, you know, they've broken the rules or whatever. And I have this ridiculous habit of asking this stupid question. I always do it. And here it is. Are you ready? It's very profound. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? That's the stupidest question you could ever ask anybody. <laughs> to start with, he don't know why he did it. You know what they'll say? I don't know. <laughs> you know what I say? I don't know either. That's why I asked you. <laughs> that could go on for ages. We're sinners. We're sin hey, you're either today a sinner or either you're a sinner saved by grace. Now, I've been preaching tonight about a laid down life. Christian, I'm talking now to the Christians for just a moment. Christian, I want to, I want to share something with you about that laid down life. That laid down life is the pattern for revival. If you're going to ever hope to see another revival in the land before the Lord raptures us off of this earth or before we die and go to heaven, it's going to come through a laid down life. You know what happens a lot of times in the life of a Christian? We get saved and we give our heart and life to Jesus. And you know what? We begin to walk with the Lord and everything's going great. And all of a sudden, if we're not real careful, we're still saved, but if we're not real careel we'll start trying to reel our life back in and start using it for our own good and start making our own decisions and start doing things our own way again. And that thing can happen so subtly and it can be very de deceiving. Let me tell you something about that. The crucified life is the life of victory. What do you mean, Brother Tim? I think you know what I mean. I think you know what the Word of God means here. You see, Jesus says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. That's the hardest thing for us to do in the flesh. That's the hardest thing for this preacher to do in the flesh. That's the hardest thing for any person to do in the flesh is to deny ourselves. But you know what? If you, ever, if you ever hope to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, first and foremost, you're going to have to do it. But I'll tell you what, it works that way in any relationship. Any of y'all married? <laughs> Three hands came up. <laughs> I thought the celibates was only the Catholic. I <laughs> There's three married couples in here, y'all. But that's okay. We can still work with that. That successful marriage is going to be through that couple laying down their lives. Amen? Amen. Is a marriage 50-50? <laughs> huh? Oh, my, yeah, marriage, yes. Praise the Lord. It's 50-50. <laughs> a 
A marriage isn't 50-50. It's 90-10. <laughs> Sometimes it's 97-3. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I learned a long time ago, man. Becky's the boss. <laughs> Amen? She totes the money. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to take a laid down life. Let me share something with you from the Word of God. You see, God wants us to lay down our lives. The Bible calls, and I'm not talking about necessarily now becoming a martyr. Hey, who knows though? The day could come that you may be a martyr for Christ. That means you may have to die a physical death for your faith. But I'm not talking about that tonight in this message. I'm talking about a laid down life simply meaning this. That means laying down my life again. I'm not talking about getting saved again. I'm talking about my will. Don't you understand? And directing my will back to the will of God. Amen? My will, W-I-L-L. -L. It's called mortification. Turn to Romans 8, 13. It's called mortifying. Hey, putting the flesh back. To, you know the flesh wants to just rear up on you sometimes. Paul said that we're in a constant battle between the flesh and the spirit. Can I get a witness? You'll find that in Romans chapter 7. We're going to, we're going to turn to Romans 8. But Paul said in Romans 7 that we live in a daily battle with our flesh. Now, I'm talking about saved people. Saved people. Paul says that the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that we cannot do the things that we, that we would. Paul said also, he says, for the things which I do, I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. He said there's a battle going on with our own fleshly nature. And, uh, and you know what? The, here's the thing. The Bible says when you get saved, the old man is dead. What does that mean? That's a Bible teaching. The moment you gave your heart and life to Christ, this, the fleshly desires, the old man was rendered dead. Now, there's still blood flowing through my body and capillaries and all, and, and, and this flesh still has blood. Hey, it's, it's alive. I've got a heartbeat. But you know what? It's judicially dead. It is to be rendered dead. But you know what your old nature can do? Your old nature can try to revive it's really a strange thing, and it's hard to explain. But a lot of people think, you know, hey, uh, what's going on in my life? I, I know I'm saved, but yet I'm, I'm battling, and, and I'm dealing with things. And hey, that sometimes I'm dealing with sins. But let me tell you what the Bible says about that. The Bible says we're to mortify our members. Let me read it to you. Romans 8, and I want you to look carefully at verse 13. Romans 8, 13. It's the laid down life. It says, for if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But look at this. But if you live through the Spirit, look at this. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You know what that means? You've got to tell yourself no when you're going against the will of God. Well, I knew revival was going to sweep through this place when I said that. Well, it's like the wave, amen? But that's exactly what the crucified life is. You see, we are now hidden in Christ. Our life is, by the way, if you want to know what the Christian life is, it's a crucified life. That means not my will, but thine be done, Father. Amen. And that's how you're going to see revival. I know this is not popular preaching. I know that this is not going to be preaching that's going to put a, a preacher uh, in the limelight. But I'm telling you right now the authority of the Word of God, this is the key to revival. It's getting out of self and getting back to God. Colossians 3, 5. A laid down life. Hey, let me tell you something now. Who do I think I am? Brother Ben, who do I think I am? If I don't think, hey, for a moment, if I don't consider that if Jesus laid down his life and I think that I don't have to lay down my life, what kind of a man am I? What kind of a person am I? And it's Colossians 3, 5, and you're waiting on me. I'm over there in Thessalonians, and, but I know where it's at. I promise. Colossians 3, 5. Look at this. This is going to bless you. It says, mortify, therefore. You know what mortify means? Put it to death. Brother, Brother Tim, are you, are, are you telling us that we need to kill ourselves? No, <laughs> I'm not talking about suicide. <laughs> the Word of God is saying, put to death your sensuous will. How does that manifest, by the way? 
What is, what is, how does, how do we know that that needs to be done? How do you know when you're not walking close to Christ? Let me ask you this question, Christian. Is pride an issue in your life right now? Is pride an issue? If pride is an issue, let me tell you what you've got to do. You've got to kill it. You've just got to mortify it. How is that done, by the way? Think positive thoughts? It'll go away? Uh-uh. No. The devil will have a field day with you if you try that. You want me to tell you how you mortify pride or any other sin? You take it straight to the foot of the cross. And you lay that pride down and you leave it at Jesus' feet. You repent of it and you, and you ask the Lord to forgive you and you leave it right there. And you say, Lord, help me. I'll tell you another key indicator that we need to lay down our life. And a lot of times I see this in Baptist churches more so than in any other place. And I'm a Baptist, so don't get mad with me. I told you I'm a chicken-eating Baptist. But I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of Baptists that need to take not only their pride, but they need to take some of their passions and kill them. Now let me explain what I'm talking about right here. We've got a lot of passions that really have nothing to do with Scripture and saving souls and being doctrinal, but they're our preferences and our habits and our passions. And we think because they're our passions, if everybody don't go along with us, and if the preacher don't go along with it or whoever, then, then there's a big problem. And we stay about half mad half the time. I'll give you a perfect example. I know a Christian right now that his passions are, and, and, I, and you say, well, Brother Tim, maybe you're judging. I don't know if I am or not, but I'll tell you right now, I know a Christian right now, not in this church, but passions are controlling or rather inhibiting that person from moving forward with the Lord. And I'll give you an example of where it's at. It's in music. It's in music. Now, you're looking at a person right now. You want to know my passion about music? If you, if, if you want to talk about my background, I like string music. It took me a long time to warm up to some different Christian music. It took me a long time. As a matter of fact, I, I struggled with that thing. But, folks, I learned a long time ago. It's not the genre every time that's the issue. It is the message that we want. For example, it doesn't have to be bluegrass string music to bless people. Can I get a witness in the house of the Lord? Now, I like bluegrass-oriented string music. But, folks, I have learned there's some of, the, there's some of the, the newer music. As long as it's got the right message and as long as it's godly, and I'm loving it. I'm loving some of it. Let me put it that way. Now, if, it's, if I can't understand it and it's bizarre, you know, maybe... My passion is going to take in. <laughs> I don't know. But the point is, I don't need to let, hey, my passions and my preferences, hey, folks, let me tell you something about that. That can hinder me serving the Lord. Everybody going in a different direction. The Bible says we're sheep. Hey, man, if it exalts the Lord and if it's with the Word of God, just swallow our pride and let's go on and serve the Lord. So maybe a lot of times it's our passions that need to die. Well, I believe this way, I believe that way. As long as it's with the book, believe it. But I'm going to tell you right now, it, if it's not biblical and if it's not life or death, it's not worth being divided over is what I'm trying to say. I'm getting loud tonight, but I feel like I need to. Sometimes I think you have to. You know what I mean? I heard people say all my life, I don't like those loud preachers. I don't like preachers that holler. I've heard people say that. I've told you all, I holler at buffet restaurants. If it's good, sometimes you've got to holler. It's, are y'all with me? I mean, man, they'll go out there and herons, you know, I've, I've seen herons fans, I mean, just screaming and hollering like banshees. Kill them! <laughs> then they get in the house of God, I can't stand a preacher that hollers. I know why, because you don't want to be woke up. <laughs> I know where you're coming from. I ain't stupid. I might be dumb, but I ain't stupid. A laid down life. Does any of you remember when the Lord first saved you? You were so close to the Lord because you gave your heart and life to him. 
But maybe there's somebody within the sound of my voice you've been reeling back in some of your life. And you've been living it sort of the way you want to. You've been doing things sort of the way that you like to. And sometimes it can be so subtle. Maybe it's just idling. Did you know idling will get you in trouble too? Well, you know, I'm just going back off. You know, I'm, I'm such and such age. I'm 20. No, I'm at 40. I'm at 70. I think it don't really matter what age. I see people idling back. I see them throttling back in the house of God. I see younger couples now getting out on God. And they've got so much going on, they've placed Christ. I don't have to say it, do I? But I want to say, sh share something with you. The more we walk with Jesus, the more is going to be required of us, y'all. Amen. Think about it like this. That laid down life is what's going to prepare you for the growth that God has planned for you in this church. Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen if things go like they normally go. I'm not a prophet. I'm just a preacher. But statistically speaking, when you get in that new building and you need it, when you get in that new building, if you take a look at the rate of growth, all you got to do is just do a little math. Look at how long you've been growing at the rate you've been growing. It's not been long at this rate. And you see and you look and you start counting how many people are in the pews. And you do a little math. Then you're going to realize how big that new building's going to need to be. And furthermore, that's going to be a good indicator for you as to how quick the new building should be filled. But you know what can happen in a new building program? I've seen it. I saw it at Pleasant Valley. I'm seeing it today at Victory Baptist Church. We've been in a new building for about three or four years. You know what happens sometimes if you're not careful? When you get in a new building, you get a little what we call elbow room. I'm seeing it now. You get a little elbow room, and it gets comfortable. And you know what will happen? Christians will start idling back. And you know what they'll do sometimes? Sometimes they'll just start getting complacent. It's not a big thing, but here's what happens. They forget their focus. And all of a sudden, things start pulling them out of the service of the Lord. Things start pulling them out of the house of God. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you. I may have told you this this week, but I forgot, so I'm going to tell it again. I'm an avid sports fan, and I really am. I've always really liked sports. I, I've never been able to really play too much sports. I was always a little too husky and slow. But I've always enjoyed sports. And I mean that. I'm not pulling your leg. All kinds of sports. I really like college ball. I really like high school ball. I like to watch it. I like uh, hunting. I like fishing. But if you ever want to get a bad taste for sports, if you ever want to get a sour taste in your mouth for sports, let me tell you how to do it. Let God call you to preach. Brother Ben, I feel lonely in here right now. I, I think I heard one amen and it might have been a cough. <laughs> Somebody might have went. <clears throat> and I do like sports, I wouldn't lie to you. But since I've started pastoring a Baptist church, it has put a sour taste in my mouth because I see so many people letting sports take the priority. Nothing wrong with sports, but don't you let it pull you away from the Lord. If anything's pulling you away from the Lord, you'll have to give an account. Of, you don't think you'll have to give an account for that. Christian, I'm talking to you. The Bible says at the judgment seat of Christ, let me tell you how you're going to be judged there at the judgment seat of Christ. Actually, the judgment seat of Christ is only for the believer. If you've made it to the judgment seat, then you know you're going to heaven. That means you're saved. You were saved on this earth. You accepted Jesus. You give up your guns and you accepted him. Amen. You get that judgment seat of Christ, the Bible says, we're going to give account for what we've done since we've been a Christian in our body. You know what I think he's going to have to deal with many one of us about? Refocusing in the wrong way. When he had a plan and purpose for us, nothing wrong with sports. Don't let sports take you away from serving God. That's what we're talking about. In Gethsemane, he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. Why don't we pray tonight? Not my will, but thine be done. If you really want revival, this is how it's going to happen. It's a crucified life. A man is no better 
than his what? Let me say it again. A man is no better than his what? You older folks know where I'm going with this, so help me. Don't leave me on a ledge. Who said it? Word. I've heard that all my life. A man is no better than his word. All right, I'm going to try it one more time, and y'all fill in the blank. A man is no better than his what? Thank you. And I believe that applies to a woman, too. We, we are to be honest before men. We're to be honest with ourselves, but above all, we're to be honest with God. And a man and a woman are no better than their word. And when you got saved, you signed on with the Lord Jesus. And it was the same as giving your word. Furthermore, when you join this local assembly, when you join this church, it was the same as giving your word. You know what to do tonight. Do you want to see the power of God again in our community? It, it, it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be fun what we have to do tonight. What we have to do tonight is not going to be comfortable. But do you want to see souls saved? You know what's going on right now? Half of us don't want to witness because we don't believe the people we're telling about Jesus will accept him. One more time, let me slow that down. Right now, witnessing is drudgery in the life of Christians, and I'm going to tell you why. We don't want to share Christ because we're afraid that nobody will listen and accept him. You know what's going on? We've got to come back down to the altar and lay down our lives. Amen? And start believing again in the power of God. And start trusting in the Lord. And that can be done tonight, Christian. Now, Christian, I've got to take my focus off of you for just a moment. Because there could be somebody here tonight that has never accepted Jesus Christ. They've never laid down their life at the, at the foot of the cross. And by the way, the only way you will ever be saved, the only way you'll ever have any hope of making it to heaven is by repenting of your sins and accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And I'm going to tell you right now, hey, it won't be the easiest walk in the world. It'll be a battle with the devil, but I'm telling you, it's the best life you'll ever live. And I'm hoping and praying that there'll be somebody tonight that'll say, I'm tired of living like I've been living. I'm tired of playing around. Hey, let me ask you this. Maybe there's somebody with the sound of my voice right now. God's been dealing with you, and you've been putting him off, and you know he's speaking to you tonight, and you need to nail it down. There could be a teenager with the sound of my voice right now. You're already doing things that you could never tell another human soul. You've, you've picked up the practice of lying and telling a lie to you right now is no different than taking a drink of water. Did you know if Christ is in your life, you won't be doing that anymore. Did you know he'll forgive you of those sins? Yeah, you don't deserve it, and nobody does. But the Bible says if we'll repent and if we'll trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the Bible says what he did on Calvary will then take application in our hearts and lives. But you've got to trust him. The Bible says, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I tell you what we ought to do, Christian. Christian, we ought to lay our lives back down for the ones who aren't saved. If you're not saved tonight, what are you waiting on? If you're not saved tonight, you can be saved tonight. I'd like to ask everybody in this house tonight to please bow your head. Please do that. Christians, would you humor me? Christians, maybe you take this time to pray as you've never prayed before. And I'd like to ask a question in this house tonight. Maybe tonight God's been dealing with an individual or maybe more. It don't matter what age you are. And you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is talking to you tonight through this message and you need to be saved, and, and you've been putting it off, and you've been letting things pull you down, and you're getting closer and closer and closer to the pit of hell, and if you died right now the way you are, you would not be ready to stand before the Lord. And if you want to be saved tonight, I'm going to ask you to take courage. And this is going to take courage, but I want to ask you to do something. Nobody's looking around. If you truly desire to be saved tonight, I want to ask you to slip your hand up. Would you do that now? Nobody's looking. 
If you truly desire to be free from the burden of sin, and if you truly desire to be saved tonight, would you slip your hand up so I can see it? Nobody's looking. Would you just slip it straight up? Okay, I see a hand. Would you slip it straight up, please? Would you slip it up? Anybody else? I see two. Thank you. Is there any others tonight that would say, I want to be saved? Don't matter how old you are. Don't matter who you are. I've seen two hands. Are there any others? Nobody looking. I want to thank you for being honest. You can put your hand down, and I see you. But here's the most important thing. God sees you, and he loves you, and he'll save you. Now, let me share something with you. If you understand clearly that Christ died for you, and if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt why he had to do that, he had to do that to pay for our sins. Tonight, in your heart of hearts, I want you to pray. The Bible calls this the sinner's prayer, and it's very simple. Would you begin to pray tonight and mean it? Lord Jesus, go ahead, pray it and mean it. It's got to be your prayer. It can't be mine. I've already prayed it for me. But if you mean it with all your heart, and if you'll trust in him today, he'll save you. Lord Jesus, I know you died on the cross for me. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, I know you rose from the dead so that I could have justification and be freed from sin. Jesus, the best way I know how, I'm asking you to save me. I'm asking you to save me. And it's just that simple. Now let me share something with you. There could be an adult man within the sound of my voice right now that God's touching your heart. And you're saying right now, if it was that simple, everybody would do it. You're wrong, sir. Everybody won't do it because of the hardness of the heart. But you can do it tonight. Why don't you ask him, Lord Jesus, save me. If you ask him tonight in your minute, would you consider praying one more thing from your heart? Only if you agree. Would you pray this? Lord, I want to thank you tonight for saving me. And Lord, I want you to help me be bold enough to tell others and make it public. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. And amen. Brother Ben, you come. There will be some tonight that will make it public even tonight. Would you come, Brother Ben? When Brother Ben comes now, if you prayed that prayer tonight, you ought to come on down. And you ought to just stand by Brother Ben and be bold enough to say, Hey, I accepted Jesus tonight. Come on and be bold and share that. Maybe tonight the Savior's been waiting for you a long time to make a decision. And I want to tell you tonight he stands ready to receive you if you just come down. Amen. Genesis chapter 6 says the Spirit of God comes upon you.